Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm David Rubin, the Brown Foundation Curator of Contemporary Art here at SAMA, and it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you to our latest in our ongoing series of artist conversations. And let's begin by welcoming tonight's guest, Joey Forso. Before we, we begin the dialogue, just a, a reminder to please silence your cell phones. I want to thank the sponsors of this evening's event, Michael Mbimbo Incorporated Architects. Thank you so much for making this possible. I also want to mention, for those of you who aren't aware of it, that we now have rotating uh, exhibitions in the Café des Artistes of emerging or lesser known San Antonio artists. And currently on exhibition is the work of Angela Fox. And she will be giving a short talk. These talks are about 15 minutes on um, Friday evening, August 3rd at 6.30 p.m. in the Café des Artistes. It's presented by SAMA Contemporaries, but it's open to everyone. We hope you'll stop by for that on August 3rd. And then on August 31st, we will be opening our next contemporary exhibition. Uh, it will actually be the kickoff event for Photo Septiembre USA. It's an exhibition entitled Adad Hanna, Intimate Encounters, featuring work by the Canadian artist known for his uh, photographs and um, videos. And in fact, uh, we're pleased to announce that w uh, one of the series we'll be exhibiting was actually uh, shot and produced right here at SAMA. And then um, for those of you who are members of SAMA Contemporaries, there will be a preview and a walkthrough from 5 to 6 p.m. And then from 6 to 8 will be the public opening, which is open to everyone, not just members. And then uh, finally, on September 4th, I'll be uh, presenting an artist conversation with Adad Hanna here in the auditorium at 6.30 p.m. So, and of course, you can always visit our website um, if you don't remember the information that I just told you. So uh, welcome, Joey. And um, we like to begin by talking about uh, the artist's early life. Could we maybe dim the, the lights over the audience just a little bit? Uh, could you uh, dim the lights over the audience a little bit? So uh, Joey, um, these are some pictures from your early years. You want to tell us a little bit about your family and your early life? Um, yeah, so I was actually born in San Antonio, so I love San Antonio very much. And but. Uh, my mom is from San Antonio, but then we moved away when I was two years old, and I grew up mostly uh, in Fairfield, Iowa. We moved from Southern California to Fairfield, Iowa when I was about eight, I guess, because my parents were really involved in transcendental meditation, and so they were um, sort of very um, intensively involved with creating this new community of centered around transcendental meditation. They both helped to start to the university there, the, the, med the TM University and the school that I attended all the way from you know, first grade through uh, when I went to college. Uh, so I have, you know, that was kind of an unusual uh, part of my background. It didn't seem unusual to me at the time, but looking back on it, I think a lot of my artistic influences come from that experience. Uh, but also, even though I wasn't uh, raised in Texas, we came down to Texas a lot. And so I think there are also strains of the, the landscape and the culture of San Antonio that are part of my work. So, Joey, how old were you when you started to learn meditation? I learned when I was four. So, you know, the first, the first technique. I put that picture of my, uh, of my, uh, my brother in there because I thought that was the first the first man I ever painted. <laughs> <laughs> the beginning of a tradition. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been a long running interest. <laughs> okay, so um, is this from high school here on the left there? <laughs> yeah, I just, you know, I, I've, always, um, I've always known that I wanted to be an artist and I have a very wonderful supportive family that uh, always encouraged that. So that's me. I mean, I, I wouldn't say I was that proud of what I'm painting there, but uh, <laughs> that's me painting. And then the the other picture is um, my my siblings and I waiting to see Maharishi in Holland. And I was actually just having this conversation with one of the Art Pace visiting artists, Yako Olivier, who has an awesome show at Art Pace right now. But um, and and he's from Amsterdam. He's correct? from Amsterdam. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who was the leader of the TM movement. He lived in this little town in Holland near Maastricht called Vlodrop. So we would go over there to visit 
him, um, you know, every year or so, and there was a lot of waiting involved, but, uh, you know, waiting around to see him. But I included that picture because th there was an interesting intersection in my upbringing between Western culture and Eastern culture. So there was a lot of the sort of the aesthetics of Hinduism and the, the visuals of Indian celebrations and Indian clothing, Indian patterning, which I think has also been inspirational. So that's us sitting there in our saris, waiting, <laughs> waiting, waiting. And then this is still in high school or early college? High school? Yeah, in high school, I actually I wasn't <laughs> I wasn't that involved with uh, taking art classes, but I was really into drama. And so um, I had this wonderful theater teacher, Rodney Franz, and he let me do all the the sets for the plays. So I was in the plays, but the the part that I loved the most was that he would, you know, kind of give me his idea. In this case, it was kind of a Thomas Hart Benton thing, and um, and then I would come in like in the mornings before school and, and after school, you know, almost every day to work on these sets. And I kind of almost forgot about that, but then in thinking about my current work over the last few years, I was thinking that that was an, also an interesting connection. Well, and I mean, you, you had a very, you were using your creativity quite a lot uh, as a youth. So you were training for your career without really knowing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I always, I always had that desire to be an artist and to be a painter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so um, this is your first studio, is that correct? Well, it's my first studio in college, yeah. Mm -hmm. I had this um, studio in the Graduate Painting Building. That's uh, <laughs> one of my critiques. I was actually, it was kind of fun to search through old pictures trying to find documents, you know, and you don't document this kind of stuff that often, and then later you wish you had more of that, because I for, sort of forgot about what the inside of that little studio I had looked like, but um, it was a kind of a chaotic environment, and I was fortunate to be slotted in with all the graduate students, uh, and University of Iowa has a really great painting program, so that was that Is was that what your concentration was at the time? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it was. And um, I guess we can see some of the work you were doing. Was it mostly assignment oriented, or were you given some free range? I was given a lot of free range. There were these mm -hmm. great painters, um, John Dill and David Dunlap, these, in these incredible people. And the, what's interesting is that I haven't strayed that far in terms of interests. I was doing a lot of sort of big expressive portraits and um, paintings of friends sitting. and. And I, the artists, I, I remember very distinctly the, the artists that I was introduced there that really started to get me in, you know, really excited were people like Alice Neal and mm. Joan Brown and um, Milton Avery, people that dealt with you know, paint and with the figure in really interesting, expressive ways. And this is continuing your college education in another studio, correct? Yeah, I went to the University of Wisconsin, which is almost exactly like the University of Iowa, so it wasn't that adventurous. <laughs> In what way is it almost exactly? <laughs> well, it just, this was like one of these interesting pivotal moments is that when I, I went to college early, and a year early, not drastically early, but so I was, when I finished college, I was 21, so I was still pretty young, and I decided to just apply to grad school, and I applied to all these schools. <coughs> And I got into uh, uh, you know, a few different schools. Some of them, one of them was in New York where I really wanted to go. But um, University of Wisconsin really wanted me to go there and they offered me a scholarship. And so it was this kind of tug of war with my parents. And I, I, at the time, I kind of felt like I a little defeated by that choice, but it ended up being an amazing experience just because it was so similar to my undergraduate. Um, mm -hmm. So were you still concentrating on painting primarily? Yeah, I was. Mm -hmm. um, and I included these shots just because I'm a big collector of imagery and I like a lot, I think most artists collect things in some way or It's another. always very interesting what the artist has on their studio wall because yeah. it's, it's what they're, where they get a lot of their inspiration. I several times had experiences in grad school because we had an amazing visiting artist program. The, uh, Michelle Grabner, who was a professor of ours, who's now at the Art Institute, she just brought in incredible people. Um, was there anyone in particular that you remember? Well, yeah, lots of people. I mean, when uh, Lane Ralia came in, who then ended up being the, the director of the Corps for a short time and, um, and curated the show called Come Forward at the Dallas Museum right around the time that I moved here, and he included me in that show which was a big, really big deal for me at that time. And so that was a, a person I had met in grad school and um, uh, Jerome Sons and you know, lots of 
I had met Jerome Sons in grad school, and then when, the first time I came to San Antonio to visit after grad school, he was at Art Pace, so I was thinking, well, this must be a pretty <laughs> happening town. <laughs> um, but what I was gonna say is a lot of people, when they'd come into my studio, the curators, they would really like the stuff I had on the wall maybe more than the paintings, so then I learned, you know? <laughs> you gotta kind of really think about that studio environment when a curator comes into the space because they would see these walls of found photographs and be like, wow, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> Don't want to upstage yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, this was my first uh, studio here in San Antonio when I moved here. Um, my great uncle, Walter Mathis, had uh, a building that he owned with an, another, another sort of real estate person, uh, the Gibbs building, like right downtown across from the Alamo. And he rented uh, me a room in that building. And at that point, now it's a hotel, but at that point it was almost completely <coughs> empty. So it was a great and kind of creepy, interesting environment because there were like two businesses in there and then me in this <laughs> giant building. So I would go up. Um, and you were still painting at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so now we're going to begin looking at some of your work uh, going back to two. 2002, so that's just 10 years, a decade ago, 10 years ago. And um, are, are these self-portraits? Uh, yeah, they are. This was from the body of work that I ended up showing at the DMA in that show, Come Forward, that I mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the whole, the pe these pieces are called Please and Thank You, but the whole body of work um, uh, were paintings of people sucking on their fingers and their hands in different ways. Uh, and what was that about? Where did, where did that idea come from? <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because at, at first I was taking pictures of people doing all kinds of things, making them into paper dolls and then collaging them into these kind of storyboards. And I kept on wanting to use the, uh, the dolls. There was these two characters that were sucking on their fingers, and I was really drawn to those. And I started to think that there was some kind of <coughs> interesting ambiguity, some element of the subversive in it. It was sort of funny, and it was also... Um, you know, kind of sensual in an interesting way. So I was thinking, well, you know, if this is what I'm, you know, I'm drawn to, let's explore that further. And I started to um, have friends and relatives. I just asked them, you know, to suck on their fingers and see what they did. And, and, and it elicited kind of a self-consciousness, understandably, because it's a little mm -hmm. bit of a strange mm -hmm. request. So um, I just took hundreds of pictures of, of people, myself and my siblings and friends, doing this, and then I started to, to, to make these portraits. Um, it makes me think a little bit about Robert Longo's Men in the City series. Was that something that might have been in your consciousness? You know, probably, I mean, I was, I'm very familiar with his work, and so probably in, in some way, yes, you know. I, I wasn't thinking of it directly, but, um, you know, I think all that stuff kind of layers Quir into Quirky work. poses and, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, Performative poses. Uh-huh. <laughs> So this is from the same show, uh, obviously. <laughs> and now tell us about this um, project. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just, um, another sort of seminal experience of moving to San Antonio is I, I, besides meeting my wonderful husband, Riley, who's standing there with me, but uh, I moved to San Antonio with some <coughs> friends from graduate school and we started a, an artist-run <laughs> gallery called The Bower, where we showed um, artists uh, from outside of San Antonio, mostly from outside of Texas, and we would invite them to come and stay with us for a few months, or not a few months, a couple of weeks, and they'd install their show. Um, and it ended up just being an incredibly um, rewarding process creatively. We met all these people, and that image was from uh, the first show we had where the artist Gian Shrasbury, who's a good friend of mine, she just came to the gallery with all these like packing equipment, a UPS kind of uh, you know, tape and FedEx boxes, and then she made us these costumes to wear. And my, my grandmother, who is uh, just a wonderful woman, she said, Gian should do the coronation next year. I think they need <laughs> a little spicing up. <laughs> so the coronation thought, or the corneation? <laughs> well, I, I, yeah. she thought the coronation, she thought, it sh she thought that would be a good idea, so I thought, that's a, that's a good suggestion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And this is an installation from the Bowery? Yeah, that the was, Bower, I'm that sorry. Was an art, yeah. yeah, an artist doing an installation at the Bower. Mm -hmm. Who was I, the artist? And now I'm blanking on blanking his last on it. name. But okay. 
I, I, I teach at Texas State University and I oftentimes tell my students that that decision to start this artist run space was one of the best decisions in terms of my creative development because it, it sort of fostered a certain kind of generosity and collaborative experience. Well, well you know, I think San Antonio is, is probably has more artist run spaces than the average city. I mean, yeah. we have quite a number of them uh, going strong and, and new ones starting every weekend like last weekend, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the kind of the nature yeah. of the art world here too, don't you think? Yeah, I yeah. feel like it's such, a, it's such a sort of giving, generous, positive community of artists. Well, and artists support one another in, in this yeah. very wonderful way, and, and I think that's why we're proud to be in San Antonio. Yeah. Okay, um, all right, so now, uh, this is a really major development in your work because it's just not straight painting, per se, so, and it's large scale, so tell us a little bit about this. Yeah, so the Gibbs building comes back in as a major player. I, I was doing these sort of uh, floating figures, these singular figures of my brother in these very kind of <coughs> dramatic um, uh, poses, and I was painting them in sort of like a kind of like a classically rendered way. So they almost I was trying to make them as sort of ong like <coughs> as possible, sort of neoclassical, the very smooth and beautifully rendered. Um, but somehow. It, it was it was missing something, or it wasn't exactly getting it to where I wanted to. So sometimes when I'd be working in my studio, I'd you know explore the Gibbs Building and all these abandoned floors. And on one floor, uh, there was this um, peeling wallpaper mural. So I just was up there one day, and I decided to paint Neil into the mural to see what that would look like. And it really clicked. And uh, something about the disjunct between. Uh, the figure and the environment, uh, the fact that the figure both integrated into the environment but also that there was some kind of separation there was really interesting to me and became kind of an interesting metaphor for how we uh, project ourselves into the environment, how we define our environment, how the def our environment defines us, and also those kind of in uh, explorations of sort of what's internal and what's external. You know, where do the boundaries of our bodies and our sort of fields of perception begin and end. And, and this is really where your, your background in meditation starts to show up in, in your work and conti will continue to do so. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's such a seminal thing. It, it, it comes up a lot, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and tell us about this one. And this, the title of this piece, actually, The Knower, The Known, and The Process of Knowing is based on a set of ideas that Maharishi Mahesh Yogi talked about a lot, which is these sort of uh, that life is broken up into these different kinds of categories or that there's different ways to process or understand knowledge. So that was what the title of this piece was. <coughs> um, but so after I made that wallpaper piece, I started actively looking for found landscapes. And I ended up finding a series of these very nondescript theatrical backdrops that were painted, um, I think, around the 1920s. But they didn't have, you know, they just had like very little going on in them, which was exciting to me. So this piece is like, you know, it says at nine by 16 feet, it's a really big painting. And um, so it was the first one that I started working on. And um, where, where did you find this material? I found it, I'm, you know, I'm a hunter for things. So I found it at a little antique store in mm -hmm. San Antonio called The Cottage. Some of you guys might have been there. It's on it's Sunset, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, I bought six of them or something um, and, and worked on a number of them, uh, but it was really an exciting find. Well, and also this, again, this brings another part of your early history into your work, which is the interest in theater and drama and the fact that you were designing theater sets when you were younger. Yeah, yeah, I think, and, and the, the sort of inherent theatricality of painting um, and this idea of the performance, I think all of those things started to really gel when I started using the found landscapes. Mm -hmm. Now I think next we're going to move into your first video animation that we'll be showing. But before we start it, um, maybe just give us a little preface about w how did you suddenly make the jump into doing video animation? Uh, well, when I was making these big, big paintings, I applied to a, a bunch of different residency programs. And I had been teaching adjunct and working um, with my great friend Penelope Spire, working for her nonprofit. And, um, so I was incredibly busy and I just felt like I really needed to make a shift so that I had more time for my work. 
And uh, so I went on these residency programs and all of a sudden I had all of this time. So for about a year and a half I was doing these residency programs. And I, because I'd been taking all the photographs and, and painting from those photographs and working in sequence, I thought it was kind of a natural jump. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't know how to go about it. Uh, so, so anyway, this first piece was not actually the first animation I started, but it was the first one I finished because this first piece was made from um, a collection of drawings that I found um, and purchased by an uh, by a woman, sort of a like a self-taught drawer named Ann Biggie in Roswell when I was on a residency there, and her family was selling these drawings and. I, I saw like five of them at like a flea market or something. And I said, those are, it's interesting. They all look almost exactly alike. And, she, and they said, well, she made 2,000. We have 2,000 of these drawings. Mm. So I said, okay, could I buy all 2,000? And they just, said, said yes. So mm. I bought all 2,000 of these drawings. And um, this was the first piece that I made. My idea was I started photographing her drawings and then um, with each set of drawings, after they cycle through once, I mirrored them, which cuts down half the pixel information. And it well, so well, why don't we look at it okay. at this point? Oh, yeah. okay. It's so a little abstract okay. until they see it. So let's let's move into okay. it now. Terrific. Tell us about the sound. Uh, yeah, so it sounds like that might have been like altered in some way, but that's just my dad doing the ham bone, which is, you, you might know what that is, like you slap your arm and then slap your leg. But uh, so it's not speeded up or anything. He's just really good at doing the ham bone. So. <laughs>